Dr. Kevin Robb, Energy Systems Development Group Leader at ORNL, and today he's going to be discussing some of the recent developments in molten salt loops here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It takes a lot of people to get work done and make stuff happen. A liquid salt test loop, probably a number of you know that this started a number of years ago. This loop has Flynac in it. On the right is that large vessel is a purification system, so we use hydrofluorination to purify the Flynac. The tank at the bottom is a storage tank. You store the salt in when it's not being used. And the loop is this kind of rectangle where this is the pump tank. Salt goes up, goes across, and goes through an air-cooled heat exchanger, then comes back. And inside this green box is an inductive power supply, an induction heater, 200 kilowatts. It's all made out of Inconel 600. That's a high nickel, low chrome alloy, relatively available. In terms of scale, uh, my head is about up to the heat exchanger here. The main piping is one inch. And this first operated during the summer of 2016. And, and the idea behind this was to serve as a versatile, you know, high temperature, force flow, fluoride salt test facility. This is one of the few operable salt loops in the U.S. with uh, appreciable power and uh, the ability to repurify the salt. Flynac, while you won't, probably won't use that in a primary system, it is a useful uh, in terms of a coolant or an energy storage type salt, but also it just provides a relevant environment for testing. And this, this area is an induction heater. What that's heating is a pebble bed Inside of a relatively large silicon carbide tube, the salt flows through it. The idea behind that was for uh, heat transfer type tests. For the last couple of years, we've gone through kind of a range of different activities. We repurified the, the salt through hydrofluorination. Occasionally, you need to do this when you open up the system or introduce new parts or pieces or instruments in it. And then we re restarted the loop. We started it back up. But on cool down, after we started the loop, after the salt had already froze, the silicon carbide tube cracked. Interestingly, this didn't happen up top where the flange is. We actually made a silicon carbide to metal flange. I mean, that's a challenging engineering problem, but that's not where the problem occurred. It occurred down where the silicon carbide tube penetrates through the pump tank. Uh, long story short, we think the pinch point formed in the seal that we used that caused a, a stress riser and ultimately a fracture in the silicon carbide tube bit of effort and disassembly and clean out and restoration of the loop. The silicon carbide tube was a like a primary member. Like I mean the salt's flowing through it and outside of it is air. So that, I mean it, it, you can't run it with it was cracked. So we took the pebbles out. That's an image of the pebble it's during disassembly. And this is a view inside this tank. So when this fractured and taking it apart it actually produced uh, little chips and pieces that fell down into the pump tank. The salt is white, what's left of the salt. Uh, the salt was drained, you know, there's some salt residual at the very bottom. And sitting down there is these little black uh, pieces of silicon carbide. I'd say that this presented an opportunity, I guess I'll call it that, to uh, do some remote activities of removing these materials uh, in kind of a hard to access area, uh, getting all these pieces out. That was an experience. Then we decided to do, replace the, uh, the pebble bed test section. We have another silicon carbide tube that we could install, but I decided to switch to a kind of a parallel channel type heated test section. So this is an image up here of it. Uh, basically, I think there's, I can't remember off the top of my head, 20 tubes, about three eighth inch parallel channels that the solid flow through. The induction coil goes around it. So here's a picture of it being fabricated. We did some analysis in terms of flow distribution, pressure drop, and whatnot in its design. We designed a filter to go in underneath this. The discharge of the pump comes up inside of here, and then there's a filter that gets placed in this region before the salt goes through these tubes. The concern was while we removed a lot of these uh, pieces of silicon carbide, we're pretty successful at that, but there could be pieces that we missed. And if you ever worked with silicon carbide, uh, monolithic silicon carbide, when it cracks, it's basically like little razor blades. We created this filter to put in line before the salt goes through the, through the tubes. Current status is we're working on installing this. This test section has been completed. It's sitting next to the loop and we're working on uh, installing that and then closing up the system. Uh, outside of that, we did a couple different activities too over the last couple of years. One was to survey valve options and create a test plan for that. Uh, that would go up here. We also examined uh, the potential for salt freezing within the heat exchanger. 
So kind of an interesting area, uh, and it's a unique phenomenon for for salt cooled reactors or molten salt reactors. You know, the salt uh, has a potential to freeze, and this air cooled heat exchanger. There's a balance between you want to reject heat, but you don't want to reject too much heat, and also salt freezes. So we did a pretty extensive analysis on the on the heat exchanger. For the next couple of fiscal years, the plan is to use the salt loop as a test bed for studying species transport and the sensors. And the idea is to use the, the salt loop as a test bed. So we're going to start with injecting some gases like chromium, krypton, xenon, uh, maybe deuterium, and tracking them around the system. From there, go to kind of other species of interest, such as iodine or cerium. Again, track those around the, around the system and in the off-gas. In parallel, a range of development of demonstration of sensors. I've already mentioned uh, Amanda with Raman and Hunter with LIBS, but also at Argonne, their development of electrochemical monitoring and control sensors. There's also a range of novel sensors that are coming out of universities, as well as some sensors now coming out of industry. And another two sensors uh, for in situ corrosion. Kind of interested in those. I'd like to incorporate those into the loop. And then uh, on the off gas, not just detecting it, but uh, within DOE, there's other activities related to noble gas absorbers. So we're looking to collaborate with uh, other areas of DOE, any on incorporating or modifying and incorporating some of those type of off gas treatment systems and putting those on the, on the back end of the salt loop. Ultimately, too, simultaneously, we could be developing and creating validation data for species tracking for codes. Facility to alleviate salt technology risk, FASTER is the acronym for this one. So this is a new loop that we've been working on constructing over the last couple of years. The intention here, this is a little different, de-risk molten salt technology for Gen 3 CSP, concentrating solar power. Not focused on, on nuclear applications, but a lot of the challenges, a lot of the technological hurdles, gaps, uh, areas that need to be de-risked are common between the two. Stuff like instrumentation, basic components, pumps, flanges, heat exchangers. There's a common needs between the two different industries. So this loop is about twice as big as the other loop that I just showed. And as I mentioned, it's under development. This will use a ternary chloride, sodium, potassium, and magnesium chloride. This goes to a little bit higher temperature. So the other one was 700 C. This one was designed to go up to 725 C. Uh, a little bit higher flow rate. And instead of Inc and L600, we chose to go with alloy C276. It's fairly similar to Inc and L600, except higher mol molybdenum, moly content. Basically, at, at high temperatures, it has a lot higher strength or allowed strength than Inc and L600. That was the main reason why we chose to go with uh, C276. It has a similar chromium content, too, as Inc and L600. Uh, salt loop volume is a little bit bigger. Uh, the power is uh, to total facilities actually a little bigger, about 450 kilowatt total for the facility, and the piping is larger. And the, the goal is to have this up and running in, in the fall of 2021. We're getting close. But down here, this is the well, inside the enclosure. Uh, this is the purification system for the salt. And then um, the outside is the, this is the pump and the pump tank. Salt goes up. This is a main heater where we can inject up to 350 kilowatts of heat. The salt then goes up to an air-cooled heat exchanger, similar to the other loop. Then the salt returns back down to the pump tank. Uh, so there's different ports where you could insert instrumentation. Um, I guess that's the highlight of the components. That is an average size researcher in terms of scale. Before this, Purifications were being done on about the kilogram or so scale. Uh, we scaled that up to about 210 kilogram batch. And actually, because of the, the, it depends on the source material you're using of the packing fraction, right? A fine powder versus larger coarse particles that we could probably actually fit about 400 kilograms inside here. But we, we completed a 210 kilogram batch purification. So this is kind of the somewhat before, and this is actually when it's, it's running. So again, this is where the salt is loaded. It's where the purification occurs. And then this is the storage tank. These were inline filters for after the process of transferring the salt. Put a bit of instrumentation on this. Uh, it provided a pretty unique insight I'm working on the publication. We monitored the off-gas, but also we included a sensor from Argonne to monitor the 
electrochemical state of the salt versus time. So down here is the salt that we started with, two different salt blends, and they both got blended together. And then at the end, this is a sample, and it's uh, a bit different than the starting material. <laughs> it, uh, purification worked out pretty good. In terms of the salt loop and construction, this is the status. Most all the parts are on site. Uh, a lot have been installed. The blue cabinets, the PLC, instrumentation controls. The middle is the pump, so uh, you know, a custom C276 pump. The pump tank down here, uh, the main heater up here. And then what's missing is the, the uh, heat exchanger. And um, that's just about done. So this is the core of the heat exchanger. There's box and then it goes into a frame. This was taken about a month ago. And uh, we're working on reassembling it now and then shipping it. And it goes up in this corner here. In terms of scale, the height of this is a little over 18 feet about five and a half, five meters, five and a half meters. My head level is probably about, about here. As, uh, as I mentioned, the system is made out of C276, and that has a code, uh, ASME allowed pressure values up to, I think it's 650, if I remember off the top of my head, C, or 675. And what we want to do is go to 725, so I worked, we worked internally and, uh, and with industry to look at uh, what data was available and analyze that data, develop uh, allowed uh, stresses, a little extension out to the temperatures that we wanted to. To be clear, that's not a code case. This is an academic paper, but uh, others might find that interesting. We developed flanges for molten salt, did some testing on those. In the other salt loop, there's only two flanges, and that was intentional. Uh, to avoid flanges in this loop, we have, uh, I think, six, seven uh, flanges in the salt flow. This heat exchanger is what we're waiting on. Uh, after that shows up, it needs to be put in place, and then the piping can interconnect. The salt is already purified, and we'll be ready to heat up and, and flow some salt around the loop. So we have some planned testing in terms of corrosion tests, heat transfer tests, uh, uh, chemistry control, uh, monitoring type tests. Uh, but after that, it's, uh, again, an open facility to come in and test uh, different components that, uh, you know, to, to de-risk them, either like universities to de-risk them for eventual industry adoption and or components from industry that they want to de-risk or gain confidence in uh, before being applied to uh, bigger and better systems. So the first question is, are there any concerns with embrittlement on C276 at those temperatures? Yes. I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, this type of facility, you know, it's a research facility. And we have different controls, uh, operation kind of schemes that we can operate under rather than a big commercial facility. So in terms of a test loop, it's not so much of an issue. But uh, for a larger facility, that's... <laughs> Uh, a, a different facility, uh, a commercial, uh, uh, that would be a, a bigger, I think, concern. We do plan on putting um, in situ coupons in there to monitor it over time. Um, so that, that was one feature that we decided to do. We did do testing beforehand, too. And besides the stress curves, we did look a bit into what, what data is available in terms of embrittlement. Have you achieved reliable operation of inline process instrumentation? So temperature, pressure, level, flow in the salt loops? Yeah, I'll say temperature is easy. Thermocouples work. Level, actually, the, they've got a couple different techniques for that. That works pretty well. Flow and pressure are kind of challenges. In terms of flow, we worked with a company to develop a flow meter. It's ultrasonic based. And for the size of piping we're using on the other loop, one inch piping is kind of on the lower end of what you'd use for ultrasonic flow meters. And there's some challenges with keeping the flow meter uh, electronics cool, but the pipe hot. And then in terms of pressure, that's an interesting one too. So back in the day, you could use map filled impulse lines with the diaphragm. Those are commercially available. They're more custom now. We've purchased two custom ones and both of those don't work. They didn't work very good at all, <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> that said, uh, I mean, Wisconsin, Mark Anderson, they've made their own, I think had success. So it's kind of hit or miss. It's not a very, uh, I, I would say at, at the current time, uh, a mature instrument that you could buy. So there are a few more questions, but for the sake of time, say we move forward, you can either answer them in the chat or if there's questions still uh, time after the end, we can come back and talk about it. Sound good? 
Sounds good. Thank you. Okay.